morning, First Presbyterian Church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And of course, we come with hearts rejoicing and hearts that are glad, for we come into the presence of the Almighty to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And we come to Him through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has turn, torn the veil in two so that we can access the holiest of holy places and that we can trust in Him as our great high priest and redeemer. And so we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is in His name that I greet you this morning. Before we enter into worship, let us turn our attention to a couple of announcements that you found there in your bulletin. I do want to mention that the online giving option uh, has been extended through the month of June uh, by our denomination. And so if you would like to contribute your tithes or your offerings uh, via um, a direct deposit over the computer, uh, you can find that link on uh, our church Facebook page, and we will actually begin to uh, email that out each week with our bulletins as well through the end of this month. If you are in need of any uh, assistance during this time, please let your, let your care group leaders know, those elders and those deacons, we'd be happy to assist you uh, as we are continuing phase one of our regathering plan. Please know that the elders are... Uh, already having some uh, conversations about when to uh, establish phase two. Um, and so we will uh, be getting in touch with you very soon about what phase two will actually look like for our church. And so please look for um, snail mail and email and Facebook posts and everything else. Our goal during this uh, rephasing, uh, regathering time uh, is to over communicate with you. And so please begin to look for uh, some communications this week. And then also, uh, there'll be a, a drive through barbecue dinner. Uh, you see uh, kind of the sign up there in your bulletin. Uh, if you would like to participate in this uh, drive through barbecue dinner that's going to be here at the church, uh, please just fill out your family name, the number of adult plates you need, the number of children plates you need, and then, of course, uh, we'll be taking up donations uh, for that drive through barbecue dinner to help establish a... Uh, um, a starting balance for Wednesday night fellowship meals when we begin back in the fall. That concludes our announcements. Let us enter into worship. God calls us to worship by his word. You see your call to worship there in your bulletin. Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 through 6 is the chapter in its entirety. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to the, you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. And so as we come to inhabit Zion this very morning, as we come to dwell in the very presence of the Lord, let us begin by singing praises to his name. That first hymn, we gather together. Let's stand and sing.
remain standing as we pray together. God, indeed, we gather together to ask you to bless us as we worship you in spirit and in truth, as we sing hymns of your faithfulness and your praise, as we commit our hearts together uh, in prayer, as we come to hear you speak through the reading and preaching of your word. We pray, O Lord, that you will indeed bless us. And first and foremost, O Lord, we pray that you would bless us by making us more like Christ this very morning. May it be our prayer each and every Sunday that we would come and leave more like Christ than when we came. And so, Father, as we sing praises to your name, as we forget not all of your benefits, we pray, O Lord, that you will indeed conform us and confront us, convict us and change us, all for the sake of your Son. And we ask that you would teach us to pray as Christ taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. It's good for us to come as we join together to affirm our faith. And you see that our affirmation of faith this morning is from the Heidelberg Catechism, questions 54 and 55, as we talk about the church. Question 54, what believest thou concerning the holy Catholic Church of Christ? that the Son of God from the beginning to the end of the world gathers, defends, and preserves to himself by his Spirit and Word out of the whole human race, a church chosen to everlasting life, agreeing in true faith, and that I am and forever shall remain a living member thereof. What do you understand by the communion of the saints? First, that all and everyone who believes, being members of Christ, are in common partakers of him and all his riches and gifts. Secondly, that everyone must know it to be his duty, readily and cheerfully to employ his gifts for the advantage and the salvation of other members. Amen. I'm going to invite Rule and Elder Leslie McClellan to come pray for the church and the world. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come together today, Lord, to hear your word and to give thanks for the many, many blessings that you bestowed upon us as our church. Lord, we have so many things to be thankful for. Lord, uh, this beautiful building that we have to worship in, our grounds which are being landscaped, Lord, our health that, that, that we're even here, Lord, we, we thank you for these things and these blessings, things that we're, really, we're not really entitled to, Lord. We are entitled to, Lord, but we didn't earn them. Lord, they're given to, to us by you. Lord, today we pray for our church. What our church stands for, may it be not only a center of worship here in Dillon, but be a beacon of Christian faith to our community. Lord, we ask you to continue to bless us as we reach out, Lord, in our, in our many ways, Lord, through our church, through our Sunday school, through the Christ, Dillon Christian School, and and Dylan Christian Preschool, Lord, continue to bless us. Lord, we pray for our pastor and his family today, Lord. Lord, a godly man who has been sent to us, Lord, to deliver your word. We give thanks, Lord, and we ask you to bless him and his family as we continue to grow together as a church. Lord, we, we say a special prayer for Zach and his family as, as they worship together and his work in his new church, Lord. Bless him and protect him. Continue to help him to grow and his church to grow as he did here. Lord, we pray for our church officers 
our elders, our deacons, women in the church, our Sunday school, our Sunday school teachers and leaders, Lord. Lord, these are all the people who are here to help, to help pass on your word, Lord, to, to be a help to those in need. We ask you to leave, lift each and every one of them up, Lord, and help us to do your will. Lord, we pray for our congregation. We pray for the physical and spiritual well-being, Lord. There are many who may have illnesses, but if it be your will, we ask you to touch them and heal them. Lord, we, we have a special prayer for our friend John Law today, Lord, as, as he is on his bed and, Lord, looking up to you, Lord, we ask that you will, will touch him and, Lord, to, to make his life here on earth just a little more comfortable as he goes to and, and to be with you. Lord, we pray for our town and our leaders. Lord, as, as we have elections coming up for all our local and state and national leaders, Lord, we ask that your hand reach out and touch and have godly Christian people to be put in these leadership positions, Lord, as, as we need it. Lord, again, we pay for, play for our state and our nation, Lord. Um, there's so many things that are, are, are happening within our world, Lord. Satan threatens us from all sides, from evil leaders that are persecuting God's people to even here in, in our homeland, our own people who prey on the young, the old, the weak, and the poor. Give us strength and wisdom to combat these evils, and Lord, so that your will may be done. Lord, we as Christians must stand our ground. We must stay in your word daily. We, we must be strong. We must be united to fight these evils with God's help and with God's strength. We pray for a Holy Ghost revival, Lord. May it start within each and every one of us and spread throughout our town, our county, our state, and our nation. Lord, let it begin with us. Lord, we thank you for your love your strength, and we thank you for our greatest gift, your son, Jesus Christ, who was made man, who died and rose again for our sins. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Leslie. You open your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, that scripture text is provided for you in uh, your bulletin. We'll be looking at Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 and 17 through 18. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, and then verses 17 and 18. We're looking at that fifth question of church membership this morning, that fifth vow that we take as we join this church, uh, and we are seeing the, the really the, the concluding thoughts of these questions. If you remember, as we kind of journey through these questions for the past couple of months, we have seen that it's very systematically written for us so that it will walk us first to the gospel and then into practical Christian living and then to see how a vital part of the Christian life is to be a part of the local church, to be members of the local church. And last week when we were looking at that fourth question of church membership, which you see there in your bulletin, we dissected how we promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of our abilities. And we came from Hebrews chapter 10 as we journeyed through that fourth vow together. In Hebrews chapter 10, it actually tells us three imperatives, and the author begins by saying, let us, and it says, let us draw near, let us hold fast, let us consider, let us consider how we are to use our spiritual gifts for the encouragement of one another, let us, let us hold fast to our confession where we can have a, a tight grip on what we believe as the cultural winds push us to and fro. Let us draw near to God. Let us come together and pursue Christ, knowing that he is our shepherd, leader, and friend. 
And if you remember last week, it sounded a little bit like a broken record because our application point was as followed for all three points. You need to be here. That I need you here and you need me here. And together, we corporately do these things that the author of Hebrews is challenging us to do. Together, we draw near to God. Together, we hold fast to our confession. Together, we encourage one another and stir up one another for love and for good works. And so this morning, as we come to this fifth and final question, it it carries through how we are to encourage one another, how we are to support one another, how we are to stir up one another. And it simply asks this, if you'll look at that fifth question, question with me. Do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? Do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of this church and promise to study its purity and peace? Now, admittedly, at first glance, that sounds a little bureaucratic, a little dry, a little uh, administrative, maybe even when it hit your ears, maybe it sounded to you a little unspiritual. But notice how the author of Hebrews will write here in just a second. Notice the vow as it challenges you not only to pursue your personal holiness, your personal peace, but the peace of this congregation and the, and the purity of this congregation. Notice how this This vow challenges you to affirm that these things are indeed needed. And so as we come to even our text, we are affirming a honor for spiritual authority. We are affirming a a pursuit of holiness that is needed, and we are affirming a pursuit of peace that is required. And you see those three points in your bulletin, and let's read our text with those three points in mind. First, Verse 7 of Hebrews chapter 13. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Then going down to verse 17 and 18. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever and ever. In the past week or so, we have been uh, giving books a little bit of an allowance, a little bit of a uh, if, if he'll do a chore, we'll give him a little monies, as he calls them. Uh, and the glorious thing about giving Brooks monies uh, is that he doesn't know if it's a $5 bill, $10 bill, or $1 bill. So guess what he's getting? He's getting $1 bills. But nonetheless, we uh, tell him to do certain things. Yesterday, it was to help me clean the garage out. And so you would tell him different things to do. Brooks, I need you to pick up this, that, and this and throw it in the trash can, and I need you to to grab these toys and put them in your wagon, and I need you to move your, uh, your electric car over into this corner, and, and I need you to do these things for me. And if you'll do these things for me, you can get your money. And of course, how do we know if he has heard me correctly? How do we know if he's comprehending what he is supposed to do? Even though he might say, yes, Daddy, I'll do it. How do we know without a doubt that he is doing what we've asked him to do. Well, he does it. That's how we know. You know, it's, uh, you know the, the sports world is kind of finally beginning to, to trickle back open, okay? And so the one thing that I'm looking for out of the sports world is for baseball to kind of start back. But we, uh, if you've been keeping up with sports programs, there's a collective bargaining agreement that seems to be putting a hold on these things. But nonetheless, we, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating being able to watch some baseball. Well, all throughout baseball, we kind of know how this works. All the coaches are standing on the baselines and they're giving all of these signs where they're patting their nose four times and they're scratching their elbow twice and then they're doing a jumping jack. And, and you're like, I don't know what he's saying, but that base runner does. 
And how, does that, how do you know that that base runner understood the coach properly? Well, he steals the base. Or he stays put. Or he lays down the bunt. Something of the sort where we know that the, that the message has been received and affirmed. And in a real way, when we come to Hebrews chapter 13, the author of Hebrews is probably a student of Paul. I'm, uh, I, I actually believe it's Apollos, but... Uh, we, we think the author of Hebrews has now given us these application points to tell us what all of this means that he has already covered before. And he tells us here that we have to do certain things and the way that we understand that we know what to do and affirm to do them is that we actually execute them. We actually do them. And so if we rightly understand the question, do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to strive for its purity and peace? If we rightly understand that question and we mean it when we say, I do, then we'll be a church consisting of members of, who have honor for their spiritual leadership. We will be a church who are committed to pursuing holiness together. We will have a passion for the harmony of this church family as well as the harmony of the church throughout the world. If, if we hear the author of Hebrews rightly, if we understand what we are affirming when we take this vow, we will indeed do this first point. We will pursue honor. We need a people who are pursuing honor. I heard one commentator say that this first point of this question pushes us to a glad and willing respect for our elders and a joyful acknowledgement and embrace of their spiritual leadership as they are the appointed shepherds of this flock. I want to read that again. It comes from a commentator you remember. The first point pushes us to a glad and willing respect for our elders and a joyful acknowledgement and embrace of their spiritual leadership as they are the appointed shepherds of this flock. Now right there in that little Sentence. I know it's a little bit of a run-on sentence, but in that one sentence, we have something that is very countercultural, don't we? We have something that's very countercultural because we, we live in a day and age where, where authority is not respected. We, we live in a day of age where, where we're consumers and we don't even like to hear our leaders talking about obedience and submission in one sentence. You think about it, it's, you know, it's election season. What if you went to a town hall meeting or something of the sort and, and, uh, and, and that candidate began to pound the podium and say, you need to obey, obey, and you need to submit. The first thing you would do is check out. The second thing you would do is not vote for them because we don't want to do these things. We don't think about obeying and submitting. You, we, we have this mindset that, our representatives are here to only serve us. In a democracy, that's true. But, but you notice that, that it changes when we come here into the local church because the author of Hebrews tells us he's speaking to this, this early Christian congregation and, and he says, obey your leaders and submit to them. And what is he saying? He's saying, I want you to have a a joyful and willing respect for your elders. I want you to embrace their spiritual leadership as the appointed shepherds of this flock. If we can use those commentators' words. You see it there in verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them. And he, he goes on to say, and do this with what? With joy. Do this with joy so that you may show your respect for them so that you may show that you're following their shepherding so that you may show that you are acknowledging them and embracing them as your spiritual head and this is a very significant thing it's a very significant thing for for many reasons but i want to mention just a couple one of the reasons that this is very significant is because our church is not a church that is personality driven our church is not a church that is personality-centered. And I hope you understand what I'm saying uh, there because we look across the, the, the universal church and we see so many of these quote-unquote mega-churches that are very much personality-driven. 
And so when that personality begins to leave or falls spiritually and has to be kicked out of the church, what happens to that church? The church crumbles. The church is closed. The churches uh, actually don't have an effective witness in their community anymore. But that's not First Presbyterian Church because pastors come and go. But who remains the same? The elders. The elders are here, uh, and they're always with you. You know, our church has been here 120 years, give or take a few years, and we've had about a dozen pastors, give or take a few. But the continuity of the church and our ministry here has always been kept up by the leadership of your elders. And that's something personally I rejoice in. Do you rejoice in that fact? And you should if you don't, because if you think about it, uh, pastors come in, right? They come in and they have their soapboxes, just like I do. They have our personal whims, just like I do. And, and what makes us not just jump on the soapboxes with the pastor? What makes us not, you know, flow with every personal whim of the pastor? It's, it's the elders who remain. It's the elders who keep things established. It's the, it's the elders who are here long after the pastor's gone. And so pastors have come and go. Some have stayed decades, some have stayed shorter for many different reasons. But who has been continuous? The elders. One day I will be gone and who will still be here? The elders. And so we rejoice in the fact that the Lord has given us a plurality and parity of leadership here within our church so that we will never be personality-driven nor personality-centered. The church will continue on in her ministry long after the pastors are going and coming. You know, one of the things that I saw so often in the Pentecostal church as I was growing up is that there was a church split about every congregational meeting. I'm, I'm, I'm being dead serious. Every congregational meeting, if it didn't matter... If we were electing pastor councils, it didn't matter if we were electing a new pastor or a youth pastor, if we were just approving a budget. Every congregational meeting had a church split that followed. And why was it like that? Because the church that I grew up in was so personality-driven and centered. If the pastor didn't get his way, he told people to leave. If the pastor didn't get his way, he would cause such a ruckus within the church that other people would leave. And we can never be like that. As we strive for the peace and purity of the church, as we strive to honor the leadership that God has established here, we are promising to submit ourselves and to obey them as, as the Lord has given them spiritual oversight of you as God's people. That's the first thing I want to say. But the second thing I want to say is, how do they do that? How do they do that? Maybe you don't know, but your elders primarily uh, lead through prayer, example, and teaching. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul tells us in his letters that they should do. Yes, they have the keys to the kingdom, the scripture says. Yes, they are the ones that admit people into church membership and dismiss people from church membership. Yes, they are the ones who are to execute the church discipline of the church, whether it's an admonishment or, or telling you you cannot partake in the Lord's Supper. And yes, they can do that. But primarily their authority, their spiritual and pastoral authority is manifested through prayer and example and in teaching. Let me explain to you kind of how that works on a practical level with your elders. I wish you could see, uh, you can actually see it, it's in my office, so just come on down after church if you want to. But we have these shepherding place mats, they're you know, probably as big as this podium almost, and they lay out before every elder at every session meeting. And those shepherding placemats have all of our people broken into their specific care groups. And we know who's in town and attending. We know who's in town and not attending. We know who's out of town. We know who's visiting our church. We know all of the households within our church. And guess what we do? We give reports on each household. We give reports on each care group, and we pray for you. And you think, well, Matt, session meetings are long, and they really are long. Session meetings can be tense, and... Thankfully, the Lord hadn't made too many tents since my transition. But they're long. They haven't taken away the length yet. Uh, but they're long. And you think, well, Matt, why would y'all extend your time 
going through each and every family and each and every household and each and every visitor and each and every ministry of the church and each and every missionary of the church. Why would y'all do that? Well, it's because we think and we believe that our job is to pray for you and we take that serious. So that's how we pray for you very practically. The second thing is uh, we take seriously our example. Your elders are men who strive to shepherd well. They pray that they can shepherd better. They strive to live lives that are pleasing and glorifying to God. They strive to love this church and her people even when you're hard to love. Are they perfect? No. Is there room for growth? Yes. But but these men are men that you have chosen as spiritual heads of this congregation. You said, as you filled out your little nomination ballot, I believe that this man is walking with Jesus. And so they lead by example, and also they lead by teaching. Many of our elders are phenomenal Sunday school teachers. Many of our elders help with Bible studies. Many of them teach informally through conversations about Christ with their family and friends. But all of them guard the teaching that happens in this church. From Bible studies to Sunday school classes. From Bible conferences to missionaries. They don't allow one man to stand behind this pulpit that isn't going to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't let one book go out with a church endorsement that's not going to teach you truths about the scripture. They are all working week in and week out to to guard you from false doctrine. They're working hard to make sure the word of God is proclaimed from this pulpit and throughout her ministries. And when we take vow number five of church membership, we are are saying, and the book of Hebrews is challenging us to see that that this work is is laborious and intense, that this work causes many long nights, and we are to honor and respect that spiritual leadership that the Lord has given. We promise when we take vow number five to do everything that we can to respect and show respect for our elders, and we take a vow to say that we'll follow their shepherding as they are the appointed shepherds of this flock. And you notice, don't you, that the author of Hebrews adds something very solemn here, very weighty here. You see it there in verse 17. For they are keeping watch over your souls, talking about the elders, as those who will have to give an account. Do you understand what the author of Hebrews is saying? It's it's very sobering. He's saying that your elders will have to stand before the throne of judgment and before God himself will have to answer for how they faithfully shepherded and how they unfaithfully shepherded. And so essentially what the author of Hebrews is saying is don't make their job harder. It's already hard enough. I heard a great illustration this week. The great uh, Baptist minister, John Gill, from London was writing to one of his assistant pastors that had taken a small country Baptist church. And he wrote this. He says, I know that you are somewhat embarrassed that you have been called to be a pastor of a small flock, but I will assure you that on the great day when you stand before the judge of heaven and earth, you will give an account for how you shepherded their souls. And on that day, you will say, this has been enough for me. That is why we need to remember our elders. That is why We need to vow to support them and to pray for them. That's why we need to promise that we will joyfully follow their shepherding because they have been called to faithfully shepherd you. And they have been called to shepherd you by God himself. And believe me, the word of God is sure. They will give an answer. I will give an answer. And so don't make their job that much harder. Joyfully honor your elders. The second point there, as you see in your bulletin, is that we need to pursue holiness. We need to be a people who pursue holiness. You notice it there in your church membership vow. Do you promise to study its purity? Do you promise to study its purity? That means that the church should be one who is pursuing Christ together. We probably know that famous book by Jerry Bridges, The Pursuit of Holiness, where he is urging your your family or you as an individual to do what every chapter? Pursue holiness. 
Well, in a very real way, what the author of Hebrews is saying is not only is that to be done as individuals, but that should be done corporately as the local church. But it also carries some weight because it's reminding you that what you do on an individual level, your pursuit of holiness as an individual Christian affects the holiness of this church. There's an Old Testament illustration that paints this picture for us so perfectly. It's the story of Achan. Do you remember the story of Achan? Because he sinned by stealing uh, items that have really been, just been banned by God's commands. And he hid them in his tent. And remember, all of these judgments were falling upon the camp, and they began to wonder why, and then they found out Achan's sin. And you think, well, what's so important about that story? Well, simply put, it's a story about how a whole nation was cursed because of one man's sin. And the spiritual principle here still is true. Your private behavior, my private behavior, when I'm off on my own, has a direct impact of the holiness that's being pursued right here at First Presbyterian Church. My behavior, your behavior in private, our personal pursuits of holiness is not just a private matter when you become a member of a local church. It's a matter of the well-being of the church as a whole. And so when you say, I do promise to pursue the purity of this church, we are saying that it matters what we do when we go off to college. It matters what we do when we're at home alone. It matters what we do when we're at work. Because your personal pursuit of holiness affects the pursuit of holiness here at the church. That's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. And you'll notice something about this membership vow that, that we have to have purity before we can have peace. We've got to have holiness before we can have harmony. Because there's no harmony where there is not a real pursuit of holiness. And so it's just not you pursuing holiness. It's, it's us pursuing holiness. And we're pursuing holiness together. We'll never have peace in this congregation if our individual lives are bearing sin. It will affect the camp. And so what we do when we promise to pursue the church's purity is saying, yes, Lord, I understand that what I do in the privacy of my home, what I do in the privacy of my family, what I do when no one else is looking will affect the camp. And so we must study its purity. We also must study its peace. That's the third point. We need a, pe a people who are pursuing a harmony. And so when we take this fifth vow, we are committing ourselves to pursue harmony together. Pursue the peace of the church. And so we are saying that we will do everything in our personal power to make sure that this is a peaceful, a happy, a safe, and secure family of believers. When we say, yes, Lord, I will strive for the peace of the church, you are saying, Lord, I am committed to do whatever I can to promote harmony within my congregation. I want to be more sympathetic. I want to be more affectionate. I want to be more kind-hearted. I want to be more humble in spirit. I want to be more forgiving when people hurt my feelings. Because it happens. But we need to understand that harmony entails the riches of blessings from God. You know, one of the things that uh, is so often overlooked within the worship of the church is the benediction. Because the benediction is what you get to do before you go home to go eat lunch. And so we're like, okay, raise your hands and do your thing. That, I mean, that's kind of our mentality, right? But we miss that actually the benediction is a proclamation of God's blessing for your whole well-being. That God calls us to worship by his word. God pours out his blessings upon us by his word. It's God having the first voice and the last voice within our worship service. And just like that, in our pursuit of harmony, we are asking that the whole well-being of the believer, the whole person of one another may be drenched in the favor of God. That's what we are striving for. 
And so when we are studying the peace of the church, when we are pursuing the peace of the church, we mean that we want our brothers and our sisters in this congregation, we want their best interest in everything, in everything. We are looking out for their total well-being and the whole well-being of this congregation. And isn't it interesting how this final, this final vow really walks us through? Because there can be no holiness if you're, not, if you're not humbling yourself before the authority that the Lord has set in place. And there can no, be no peace if we're not pursuing holiness. It's all very systematic in nature. We have, to, we have to understand that it flows this way, that we must first submit ourselves to the spiritual oversight of these elders. Then we may pursue holiness together, and then, only then, may we enjoy peace forevermore and so when we come to this fifth vow we are pledging ourselves to study the purity and peace of the church and I love the way it says that study it it means it's not just a passing moment or a passing thought it is an intentional working towards the peace and purity of the church we're going to pursue harmony together We are going to pursue peace together. We are going to follow the elders together. And all of these things that we vow in this question of membership, all of these things work together so that we may what? It goes back to that fourth question. So that we may stir up one another for love and good works. Beloved, if you will honor your elders, you will pray for them. You'll pray for their godliness. You'll pray for their decision-making. You'll gladly follow them. If you are to pursue the purity of this church, you are going to be a people who's characterized by Christ-like behavior. You know, one of the things that the world hates about the church is that it dismisses us so quickly because we look so much like the world. If we are pursuing Christ, we will not look like the world. If we take this vow seriously, we will not look like the world. We'll actually look very countercultural, submitting to one another, loving one another, forgiving one another, individually and collectively, we will look different from the world. And so we have to study its purity, and then we have to also pursue its peace. You know, one of the things that's so clear the past couple of years and the past couple of weeks is that this world knows a lot about discord. This world knows a lot about discord. This world knows a lot about chaos. We see it on every level. We, we, you know, I'm, I'm only 30 years old, but there's more conflict today than there ever has been in my life. We know about these things, but, but how much of a statement, a bold statement for Christ is it when we pursue the peace that we have here in the church? We need a harmony that exists because we are quick to forgive one another in times of hurt. We need a harmony that exists because we are quick to be reconciled to one another in the church. We need a harmony that exists because we are quick to accept one another in the church. And you understand, right, what is happening here in these membership vows. Not only are we doing this to the glory of God's name, not only are we doing this for the good of God's people, but we are doing this so that we may be witnesses to the world. Because vow number five, vow number four, vow number three, vow number two, vow number one are so countercultural that there will not be a doubt of who we belong to if we will strive to do these things that are written for us in our five membership vows. And so when we answer these questions, and we mean it, we understand how radical and how revolutionary and how important It is to be good gospel witnesses to our community, to our state, to our nation, and to our world. And so can we pray even right now that we would be living Ebenezer's for the Lord Jesus in our honor, in our holiness, and in our harmony. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do come thankful for your word that convicts us, that changes us, that conforms us. And so, Father, we pray that it would do that very thing right now that you would make us look more like Christ, that we would honor our elders, that we would study the, the peace and the purity of this church, that we would pursue holiness and harmony together.
for the sake of thy name and for the good of your people and for the light into the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's good for us to sing in response to God's word. And so let's sing uh, that hymn, Lead On, O King Eternal. Please stand as you are able. receive the Lord's blessing, and then after the benediction, let us sing the doxology together. Now the maid of, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.